Johnson, living free in a caustic culture. Living free in a caustic culture. And uh, I like that term caustic, caustic culture, and I can't even hardly pronounce the word because it reminds me of uh, uh, where I've watched uh, people, e emergency rescue people when they're in an environment where there is dangerous um, things in the atmosphere. And we've got a ring up here, by the way, if we could eliminate that, that'd be great. But uh, where there, there might be a, a dangerous chemical. What do people do when they, when they get in that caustic atmosphere? They put on a hazmat suit. And uh, the picture that's on the screen is a picture of a, uh, well, it's kind of a parody about hazmat suits. And it's a reflection on the time that we were in recently where we had to wear masks and gloves. You couldn't touch anybody or be near anybody. But it's somebody in a hazmat suit that was getting ready to go out and socialize. And you just look at that and you think, well, you know, if it's a caustic culture and there's a lot of stuff out there that is dangerous, you wear gloves, you cover your face, and you don't really interact with anybody. And you're really missing out on life. And there's just a lot in our culture that is caustic. And what happens when that causticness or that harshness in our culture becomes obvious to us? We do just like that picture. We start putting on shields and barriers and stuff to keep us safe. We don't want anybody to see us for who we really are. We're afraid to touch anybody. And we start putting up barriers. And I just believe that the causticness of this culture has caused a lot of God's people to suit up in something that separates them from God, something that separates them from one another, something that separates us from the world. Often there's an intimidation and fear of the world. We're afraid it's going to kill us in some way, like it's some deadly chemical. But I've got news for you. You are here on assignment to be in this world, to be the light in this world right where you are. And uh, so tonight we're going to talk about living free in a caustic culture. And whenever we talk about this and freedom from the world and the influence that it brings, uh, I want to be, I want you to know this. That when I talk about living free from the world, if I use that term, there's a lot about our world that is beautiful. Around here, you have mountains and trees and even the leaves change colors. You have streams. One of the delights of my life is when I'm going places in our area and you get to go around a mountain road and there's just a stream beside the road. To me, that's just one of the most beautiful sights. It's beautiful when the rock ice is over and it looks like a sheet of ice. It's beautiful when there's snow on the ground. It's beautiful when things are blooming. I just love the beauty, and there is a beautifulness to our world. And I'm not talking about being free from that, but there is a part of our world. When the Bible talks about our world in a negative way, this is what it's talking about. It is talking about a, the fallen universe that is hostile toward God. It includes people, but it also includes the principalities and the powers of darkness. There are people with uh, ideas and philosophies but there are, uh, that we're going to see just a minute in Colossians chapter 2. And I want to encourage you to go ahead and open your Bible there if you haven't yet. But I also want you to know this world that has fallen is being dominated by what in one place is called the prince of the power of the air. In other words, the enemy in his kingdom, or Satan, or Lucifer in his kingdom, there is one of those powers, maybe Satan himself, that is called the prince of the power of the air. There's an influence that happens in our environment that can just make you lose touch with God, can cause you to lose uh, you know, confidence in your walk with God. It can press you, oppress you, make you agitated and excited. There's all sorts of things that can happen by the spirit of this world. And it can cause you to just lose the, the blessings that God has put in your life. It can cause you to forget that you're a child of God. It can, how many of you have ever had just an incredible encounter with God? And, and I asked you this earlier, but, but then suddenly the memory of that was gone. 
because of all the pressure that was on. That's the spirit of this world working against you. And so it's the fallenness of our world that's hostile toward God. It's the human society that uh, in an evil sense that has turned away from God in Christ. They have no interest in God at all. So when we talk about living free from this world or the causticness of this world, as a believer, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the part of it that's fallen, that rubs us wrong. And most, well, it almost always manifests through people and through things that people do. Is everything okay? Is everything okay? Okay. So it almost always manifests through people. So um, uh, in, in some way, but the, the, the causticness of the culture. And uh, before we read in Colossians chapter 2, there is another verse that comes to mind, and I just want to throw out there to you, because almost all of you will readily remember the parable of the sower. Matthew 13 is where it's found, beginning, I think, with about verse 1. And that whole chapter explains it. But there's one particular, and if you'll remember it, there were four different places where the seed, which was the word of God, was sown. The same seed was sown in every place. And only one place did the seed actually produce a crop and produce, you know, a multipl uh, multiplication of what it was given. And uh, so the, the, the seed and, and the, those seeds represented different things. But in Matthew 13 and verse 22, it says this about the seed that fell among the thorns. It says, now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. So you hear the word, but what can happen? Jesus tells us in this, that you hear it and, and not only can you hear the word, it can ignite faith in you. I mean, it can ignite joy. It can ignite all sorts of confidence. But if you're not careful, the cares of this world, and we all have cares in this world. There is no life in this world without cares. How can I live in a way where those cares don't steal the word of God from me? Jesus said it can steal the word of God. It can, it can uh, choke the word of God. The cares of this world can choke the word of God out of us, and it can become unfruitful. And we want to be fruitful in this world. We want to be free from the caustic culture that we're in. We want to overcome the world. And so we want to find out exactly how that's going to happen. And uh, in Colossians 2, um, uh, I'm going to begin reading with verse 6. Colossians 2 and verse 6. And uh, in Colossians 2 and verse 6, the Bible says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. And I, I just really like this whole passage of scripture and I want you to get the gist of what is being pictured here. Just like you have received the Lord, walk in him. Now that means putting one foot ahead of the other, you keep moving forward. And to walk in the Lord is to walk with him in everything you do in every place you go to walk in the lord is to live a life with him that everything that he has said everything you've received you bring with you that means when you walk into the grocery store you bring jesus with you when you go to the gas pump and gas has gone from two dollars a gallon to four dollars a gallon you walk with jesus it means that when you're going down the interstate and somebody cuts you off in the, in, in, you know, in, in the traffic and you're thinking, what in the world? You still keep Jesus with you, okay? You walk with the Lord. When you go to the mailbox and you pull out mail and you get something in the mail you really didn't want to receive. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever get something in the mail you don't want to receive? You're still walking with Jesus. No matter what goes on, you're walking with Jesus. But you have to make the determination in this world to walk with Jesus. And so as Paul is writing to the church at Colossae here, you have to make that determination. Whether it's in your home, whether it's in your job, whether it's in the community, wherever you are. He says, walk in him. And he goes on and says, rooted and built up in him. And I'm just going to stop right there because the only way you get rooted is through challenges. You get rooted to dig into the Lord through challenges. 
And, and what happens? You're walking along with the Lord and suddenly something caustic hits you. And you have to remember the word of the Lord. And you have to remember the Lord who is with you. And you pull that up inside of you and you live from that. You live from the Lord. You live from his word. So you get rooted and build up in him stronger and stronger. And trouble will always help you get stronger. It'll help you go deeper. It'll help you get stronger if you'll make the determination to. The enemy intends for you it, to take you out. But I, I, we, we're not to the main verse I want right now. But I'm going to tell you before we get there. The enemy designs your demise. But God designs you to be rooted and built up. He wants you stronger. He wants you to go higher in him. There's a storm brewing outside, and there are some trees that are going to fall in the storm that comes. There are some trees that have put down roots through years and years and have built a foundation that they're going to stand. And in the day that we're living in, you have to have people that are rooted and grounded. You have to have people that are built up and strong. And it's not about for yourself. It's being built up in the Lord. And I think we should remember that. And he says, uh, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. And uh, man, this, I'm, this is just too good. Established in the faith. In other words, whatever comes against you from the causticness in this world, and, and I'm going to tell you that one of the primary goals of the enemy is to take you out of your faith. When can you remember in the Bible the first time there was a caustic something from the enemy injected into the world. Genesis, where Adam and Eve, you know, it's what I think about. And the enemy comes in and what does he say? Yea, hath God said. And instantly the enemy puts this up there and there's this abrasiveness that starts to occur. And, and, and he's trying to take people out of faith in the Lord. Oh, man, you've got to get the picture. The devil has never changed his way of operation. He's always trying to take you out of faith by the suggestions that are out there. Now, they're much more complicated than they were in Adam's day, but you can reduce it all back to the same thing, the enemy trying to take you out of faith. And he says, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught. And, and my goodness, if ever there's a time we need to be taught the word of God and to be rooted in the word of God, it's today. Rooted in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Come on, somebody say thanksgiving. Come on, somebody say thanksgiving. I'm thankful for the word. I like it for when the word steps on my toes. <laughs> I like it when the word turns on the light in my life. And, and, and it just shows me stuff that I don't really like. No, I was talking to someone earlier today and I was telling them, really, there are times when God shines the light on something in me or in his word that I used to didn't like it because I didn't like it when, when the light came on. But over the years, I've just learned every time, if God shines the light on something, it's always for my benefit. He wants something to change in me that's going to help me. Can you say amen? And uh, so, but being thankful for the word of God. Verse 8 was where I was trying to get to. And he says, beware. All right, beware. All this good stuff that's been put up here. And you've got to remember all stuff that was before this. Because if you don't remember it, in verse 8, I'm telling you, these are the kind of things that knock people off the course. I want to talk about them just a minute. He said, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. And this verse is just filled with ways that the enemy tries to come at God's people through other people. And he talks about, number one, he says, beware lest anyone cheat you. And I just, I just like that word cheat where he talks about cheat you, which means he's trying to get the advantage. He's trying to take something from you. He's trying to cheat you out of something that God has for you. This is the nature of the world. The world is trying to cheat you out of the blessings of God. I can think of so many ways that the world is trying to cheat people. I think about when the world has made it, you know, has, is trying to cheat people out of their identity. Trying to make them think, I've got to change my sexual identity so that I can be happy. 
Instead of believing that God created me the way he wanted me to be. He made me what I am. I want to celebrate what I am. I'm a male. I'm going to be a male. I don't care what anybody else says. Or I'm a girl. I'm going to be a girl. I'm a female. You know, but the enemy is trying to cheat people out. God has designed every person for a, a, a reason. And we're here, but the enemy is out to cheat people, to steal from them the things that God has designed for them to walk in and have. He says, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy. For well, what in the world is philosophy? Well, philosophy, for one thing, if you look at that word philo and sophie, philo and sophie. Philo means a friend, and Sophie is wisdom. And if you put the two together, philosophy, philosophy, then you have friend, wisdom. And so you think that in that word, that, wi that wisdom is a friend. I learned a long time ago that some of the most corrupt stuff in this world is the philosophy of men. I, one of the first courses I took in a university in uh, Pensacola at the, it was a junior college then. I don't know what it's called now. Pensacola Junior College, it was called back then. And there was, uh, I had to take a philosophy course. And the teacher was, uh, was a, a reprobate Southern Baptist preacher who had turned his back on God and had become a philosophy teacher. In fact, the year before I took the course, he had been at a philosophy conference and he had introduced a philosophy that said this, God is neither a him or a her. We need to call him Kim and Kerr instead of him and her. You know, that's been back in the mid-70s. And way back then, he had introduced a philosophy degrading God. Brother and sister, I want you to know that's the way of this world. When the Bible talks, this is the only place in the Bible this word is used. And it's talking about a, a wisdom of this world that is contrary to God's wisdom. And what we need to know is this world has a lot that looks wise. And there's a lot of good wisdom in the world. But there's a lot of it that is contrary to the word of God. And the church has to be rooted and grounded in God enough and his word to know when the wisdom of this world is contrary to the word of God. I, you know, there, there's one particular place that there, there's a philosophy in this world that's very prevalent now. Don't judge me. You can't judge me. Oh, really? Get real. You, need, you know, I'm going, to do a, I'm going to do a lesson about this one, maybe Sunday morning. I'm going to talk about it's your, you, you, it's your responsibility to make a judgment. And somebody say, oh, Brother Jerry, I, I don't have time to explain it tonight. But I want you to know everybody in here and anybody listening to this makes judgments every day. If you choose to go to the dentist, you choose to trust that dentist. If you go online and you check out a doctor and there's a lot of bad reports there, you make a judgment. I'm not going to that doctor. If you go to choose a car and you read a report about this car and it says this, or, or, a car, that's a mechanical thing. But you judge people all the time. There are, are always judgments that we make. And to say that we're not supposed to judge is just a stupid thing. And there's a reality that we in the church have a responsibility to make discernment and judgment. But the philosophy of the world, there are so many philosophies of the world that are contrary to the things of Christ. And, uh, but when it, when it comes to philosophy, this is the real issue. And I want you to understand this. When it talks about the philosophy of this world, it's man loving his wisdom and his thoughts and his ideas above God's ideas, which is exactly what happened in Adam and Eve. They decided they had a better idea. And man has decided he had a better idea so a man could be married to a man and a woman can be married to a woman. And those things are not from God. And, uh, you know, but that's the way of the world. That's the philosophy of the world. And I don't, you know, none of us hate anybody. And I know people that struggle with homosexuality and all that. And, and, and I, we can talk about that one night if you want to. But I just want you to know that we, we love people. But I want you to know God's plan is not that. And we have to declare, you know, regardless as to how much I love people that are living in sin, I can't say their sin is okay, whatever that sin is. 
So, but the philosophy of the world. And it talks about, he says, the philosophy of the world and empty deceit. And whenever he talks about empty deceit, that just really stirs me up. Because empty deceit means that, that there's an intention to deceive. There's an intention to try to take away from uh, what God is saying. To, to bring you into something that is going to trap you and, and get you down into emptiness. And he goes on and says, and according to the traditions of men... And uh, the traditions of men, and, uh, you know, there, there are just a lot of traditions that people get into that are contrary to Christ. And we've got to be rooted and grounded in Jesus to not allow these traditions to, to choke out the Word of God in our life. Can you say amen? Well, brother, uh, I just want you to know that God has uh, given us the answer, and the answer is in Jesus, and to keep our focus on Him. And, and it's not only the traditions of men. And uh, who can think of a tradition of man that will take you away from God? I'll, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. Here's one. Uh, well, God's in, you know, when something doesn't work and, and we don't know what's going on, we'll say, well, God's in control, so let's just put it on him and let's blame him. And, you know, for this reason, I, I run into people all the time who are, who are basically mad at God because they think God killed somebody or they think God caused some horrible problem to come. And the last I heard in Jesus, he said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life. And Jesus was the exact representation of the Father. I was uh, speaking with someone earlier today who was telling me about what a glorious encounter with God they had had in the not too far distant past. And how that, that after, since from then to now, it's like the most horrific time in their life has ever occurred. And I'm going to tell you what God did in that glorious time was a deposit from heaven that God intended to empower them and for them to rise up as a child of God. But the enemy has seen the deposit that God has given and is out to disarm and to destroy that. And I'm going to tell you right now, the enemy will try any way he can to knock you off your rocker with the Lord and try to get you out of sync with God's plan for your life. It's the spirit of this world, tradition. You know, I'll tell you, there, there are uh, religious traditions as well. There's not only, not only are there uh, the traditions of of, um, of, uh, of, of the world, but there are also religious traditions. And uh, <laughs> there are lots of religious traditions. And uh, sometimes I say, people say, you know, we don't like to be in a service where you get all excited when you're worshiping God. And they've been raised in a very quiet environment, and that's okay if a person wants to worship like that. But you know, tradition can kill you. What if God is so in you and you just want to lift your hands and say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. The Bible says things like clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. There are so many expressions of worship in the Bible, but tradition has people locked down. And the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength, but tradition tries to push people out of that. And there just comes a time you have to break with your tradition. There was a time when tradition had me locked in a certain environment with uh, people who are really, really good people, but, but they did not like some of the things that I was finding in the Word. They didn't believe in being baptized in the Holy Spirit. They didn't believe in uh, the supernatural and miracles and things like that. And as much as I love those people, I had to break out of that tradition to step into the fuller things of God that I was seeing in the Word of God. You get in the word of God and it will live inside of you and it will cause you to begin to break with some of the traditions of the world. The problem you're going to find is this. When you start trusting God and believing his, world, his word, you're going to find more conflict with the world because the world doesn't want somebody walking in faith, walking in victory, walking in the joy and peace of Jesus. And I'm just going to tell you, I have a victorious philosophy from the Word of God. I understand that times are going to get worse and worse, but I've got a greater reality, and my reality is rooted in Jesus. And in fact, I can tell you one of the key places on the scriptures that I gave you, if you look down to Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4, and I want you to see what it says. And it's talking about Jesus, and I want you to look at it with me. It says, who gave himself for our sins. That's enough just to shout hallelujah about right there. He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us 
from this present evil age. I have to believe that the Jesus who died for my sins did it for the reason that in this world, in this caustic environment, that he saw the pain and agony and all the stress that it was bringing upon us. And he said, I want to deliver you out of that. I want to bring you into a place of peace with me. I want to give you something that is greater than all of that trouble that is going on. And I believe, and I baptize myself in this word, and I believe he overcame the world, that he might deliver us from this present evil age. And the word there is eon. Sometimes it's translated world in your Bible, but it's talking about this period of time that we're in where the whole worldly environment is antagonistic toward God and Jesus delivered us from our sin that we don't have to be buried beneath it and that's enough to make a dead man shout whenever you realize I don't know if you've ever been buried beneath the world buried beneath the worries buried beneath the bills buried beneath the struggles buried beneath family problems buried beneath your, your community problems buried beneath school problems buried beneath work problems buried beneath health problems you just go on Buried beneath things breaking down in your life. You know, buried beneath all these problems. Oh, I get a speeding ticket. Oh, I have an unexpected bill come up. And it just feels like you get buried. I've got a word for you. Jesus bore our sin and died for us to deliver us from the power of this evil age. We ne- we're not out of this world. We are in this world. But this world is never, never, never intended to control you and me. Can you say praise the Lord for that? Come on, you can give the Lord a praise offering. Hallelujah. And uh, so Galatians 1 and verse uh, 4 says, to deliver us from this present evil age. And look at the end of that verse. It says, according to the will of God our Father. Oh, hallelujah. So somebody, well, maybe it's just the will of the Lord that I just suffer. Yeah, you're going to have tribulation. Jesus said in this world you will have tribulation. But it is not the will of the Lord that you walk in defeat. It is the will of God that you walk through that trouble with your heart full of God, with your eyes focused on him, with your voices lifted in praise and worship. Remember we saw giving thanks earlier? I'm getting rooted and grounded in the Lord. I'm pulling on my big girl pants or I'm putting on my big boy britches. It's time to get in the game. And so a lot of us may have coasted along and suddenly something will happen and your world seems to fall apart. And God says, you remember all that stuff I've been telling you? It's time to start putting it on. It's time to put on your faith. It's time to put on your trust in me. It's time to put on your prayer life. It's time to know how to intercede and pray. It's time to know how to resist and forbid and deny the enemy into your world when he tries to come and stand on the word of God. Hallelujah. Picking up from some of the stuff we talked about last Sunday. And so all of this stuff is, is, is going on and, uh, and uh, we find in Colossians. But let's just look on down in the word of God and let's see just a, a couple of other things. But here we are in, in, the, in the church and, um, uh, and I want to go to uh, John three sixteen, And that's uh, probably one of the most familiar verses in the Bible. And every one of you can speak it so I, I really don't have to go there. Somebody quote John three sixteen for me. Come on. Come on, for God so loved the world, go ahead, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, the Bible there says God does what to the world? He loves the world. And then, but now let me give you another verse. Let me contrast that with 1 John 2.15. And you have that on the bottom of your page. 1 John 2.15, the Bible says God loves the world. Colossians 2.15 says what? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All right, look at that. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But we just read in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Now, what's the difference in those two? When the Bible talks about, for God so loved the world, he's talking about the people who are fallen under the depravity of what 1 John 2.15 is talking about. They've been captive and held down by world systems. 
When in John 3, it says he loves the world. He's talking about the people in this world, the people that he's broken for. God loves the whole world. And I don't care what your sin of choice is. God loves everybody. Can you say amen? I said, yes, God loves everybody. I said, God loves everybody. And God loves the whole world. But so we're not, so we are to love the same world that God loves. We are to love people. There isn't anybody that we have a right not to love because God loves the whole world. But yet the Bible tells us in 1 John 2, 15, to do not love the world. And this is a caution to us. He is saying, in other words, the world is going to try to get you to love it. It's going to try to get you to connect with it in a way that you want everything the world wants, the way the world does it. And pretty soon, your eyes will become changed and your, your countenance will become changed. Your whole life will become filled with greediness and, and all of the sins of this world. You just look around your world and you start noticing people that are given to sin or greed or lying or any particular thing. Their whole nature is shaped by the sins of their choice. Their whole countenance, their whole life, their body starts being riddled by problems because of, of choices that they make. So when you, but he says, don't love the world or the things that are in this world. And he says, if anybody loves this world's systems and all that's going on, the love of the Father is not in him. There is something about the love of God when you know him that it separates you from this world. It says, yes, we love the people, but these things no longer have the allurement to me they used to. That it doesn't have the controlling influence on my life that it used to. I shared with someone recently, in fact, Monday night at our Ruth house gathering I shared with the ladies I remember when we were looking at purchasing this property here that was bank owned at the time and uh, I was coming down here from uh, Jasper where we live into ball ground and as I'm coming down on the side of the road there was a, uh, a four-wheel vehicle a four-wheel drive vehicle of some kind on the side of the road and my wife and I used to jeep ride for De for years we we did jeep riding you know decades ago 30 years ago i guess we were jeep riding and it was just our it was our weekly recreational activity and we loved it going up into the mountains and trails and so forth and so on all over the place we'd go mainly in north georgia north carolina tennessee and the like and um but uh, so, but I hadn't had a, a Jeep in a long time. And I see that four-wheel vehicle on the side of the road. And, and this is the thought that comes to my mind. As I'm riding by, this is the thought. I can own that. I mean, that was the thought that came to my mind. I can own that. And about the time I thought that, it came to me. The attitude that I was looking at that with was wrong I could own that it was like yeah just let me have some of this world and soon that vehicle could have owned me and there's nothing wrong with that vehicle my son is into four-wheel drive Toyota pickups right now and I wouldn't mind having an old Toyota four-wheel drive pickup to be able to go into the woods with them and do the things that we've always loved to do but you know let me tell you it's not the same thing there was a time I knew by the very drive of my heart, it was the world trying to say, do you want me or do you want what I've got for you? You know, it was about that time. And I, I'll tell you this, that um, there were, uh, it was when we we're about to buy this property and, and three different job opportunities came available. One with the federal government in, in the uh, prison system as a chaplain, uh, one with a, uh, a company down in, uh, Fort Walton Beach area, a, a, just a really good position, and uh, another with a real estate company. There's just things that had just, just back to back within a week, three different things came up, but nothing had been open in a long time. And, and if you can imagine, you talk about security, and, and listen, I know what it means to live by faith. And I'm going to tell you, all of those things look good. But the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, you can have those things if you want them. Or you can know me and know my glory and know my power and walk with me. And it wasn't a question. I said no to all of them. None of them, you know, but all three of them. And, you know, it's about this thing. The world will try to get you to love it and want it. And there's nothing wrong with any of those jobs. I would gladly have handed them off to one of you, and you could have taken any one of them and, and done something with it. And that would have been God's plan and purpose for your life. But that wasn't God's plan and purpose. Do you see the picture? The world was trying to lure me back into it. 
And in your ways, the world will try to lure you back in. But it's all trying to snuff out the life of God and take the love of God out of your heart that God has put in your heart. And you have to guard your heart and not allow those things to happen. And uh, uh, let me see. In, in John 16 and verse 33, uh, the Bible says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Brother, I want you to know, I want to start with that. When Jesus said, I have overcome the world, he is saying all the powers of this world, all the allurements have tried to get to me. The enemy has tried to get to me, but their power has not taken me down. What hope do you have that you can break out of the world? What hope do you have that you can keep the victory through it? Let me give you an example. The world tried to steal the joy of Jesus. They said, we'll nail him to a cross. The Bible says that they whipped him and they beat him. And oh, by the way, we're coming close to Easter. And we often think, well, he was whipped with 30, 40 lashes saved one, 39. But you've got to remember that was a Jewish law. Jesus was not crucified and beat under a Jewish law. He was beat under Roman law. There were no limits under the Roman law. I don't know how many times he was beat. But I want you to know it was a horrible thing. They, the enemy did the best. The world did their best to take the joy and the peace and the confidence from him. But Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 tells me, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Brother, I want you to know, he set his heart on something that was beyond this world. There was something that gave him strength that was from another world world the joy of the reward of being faithful and doing what the father gave him to do he realized that when he went through this he was coming up the other side and he was coming out of the grave with the keys of death and Hades brother I want you to know he had some joy in front of him he realized that when he came up out of the grave whenever he bore that on the cross he was paying a price for our healing paying a price for our sin destroying the power of the oh there was some joy inside of him. He had a body that he was putting together. He had a kingdom that he was establishing. He had an ecclesia, a people on assignment that he was setting in order. Brother, I want you to know there was a joy inside of him because there would come a day when he would return back one day and his people would be ready for him and the bride and the lamb would come together. All the knees that would not bow to him would bow. There was a joy set before him that one day this earth would become the full of all that the father intended it to there was a joy in front of Jesus that drove him forward hallelujah hallelujah the Bible says he overcame and it was that joy that moved him I believe and, and he says he says in me you have peace in this world you're gonna have tribulation but in me you're gonna have peace now how many of you have been out in the world this week all of you all right how many of you have some trouble in the world all right but you come over here to the church and you get in Jesus, right? What we got to learn is to take Jesus with us, to walk with Jesus, that we keep him rooted, that we don't lose him. That's sort of like somebody saying, Pastor, when I get up in the morning, I put on the whole armor of God. They say, don't you put on the whole armor of God when you get up in the morning? No, I don't. Why not? I didn't take it off when I went to sleep. Have you ever had a night of sleep where it seemed like the enemy came after you? Brother, I want you to know when you put on the whole armor of God, you keep it on. I've learned to contend for my rest. I've learned to contend for my mind. I've learned to contend for dreams from the Lord. I don't put up with that stuff that comes from the enemy. I'm not just, I'm just not passing through this world oblivious to this stuff that is there. It's there. So, but in him we overcome. So, uh, you will have tribulation. We've got to stay in Jesus. All right, John 17. <clears throat> John 17. And I want, to, I want to get to these before we close tonight. And so, oh man, I just, uh, I got into too much stuff on the front end. Of John 17, and it's not printed on there for you. You're going to have to look at it on the screen or open your Bibles. The John 17, beginning with verse 13. Uh, you either have to open your Bible and look at the screen, but here we go. Uh, and I want you to look at this in the Word. It says, but now I come to you 
And these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Whew! I just told you about the joy of Jesus. And he said, I'm speaking to you because in the world, somebody say in the world. world. Not out of the world. When you get to heaven, you're not going to need the joy of Jesus. Brother, you're going to be eternally in the bliss of Almighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that will be a great place, right? But he says, I come to you in these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. That same victory for you. Verse 14, he says, I have given them your word. Yay, hallelujah. How many of you think it's a good thing to get the word of God? I have given them the word, but but wait a minute. It says the world has hated them. Wait a minute, they have your word, but the world hates them. Why? Because the word tells you you're not of this world. I'm in this world, but I'm not of it. And it's dragging me over here to Jesus. And friend, you just got to understand that there are people who are not going to understand you praising God, you worshiping God, you studying his word, you being faithful to him, you giving, you serving, you loving, you forgiving people and all the things that comes in the, in the kingdom of God. There are people who won't understand it whenever that starts to happen in you. But he says, I've given them my, your word and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. And when Jesus said, just as I am not of this world, I would beg you, I would challenge you to find one person ever in all of history in past or today that has ever cared more for the world and done more for humanity and laid his life down to to serve and to give any more than Jesus. He was not of this world system, but it was the world of people that were hurting and broken that he came to give himself for. And he goes on and he says, verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. So how many of you have ever said, Lord, please take me home? Anybody ever had one of those moments? Anybody ever been tempted to help God? (laughs) I mean, I'm just telling you the truth. We go through some stuff sometimes that we would like to help God get us on the glory. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Maybe you haven't. All right, good. I I know people that have. You know, they know they're going to heaven if I could just help him. But we don't want to do that, of course. Oh, man. But he says, I don't pray that you take them out of the world. Why? Because we're here to bring heaven to earth, but that you should keep them from the evil one. In other words, don't let the devil get them. They're in this world, but I'm praying for their protection. And my friend, if Jesus is praying for you and you're praying for you and you're standing on the word of God, what can you lose? I'm telling you, you can't lose for winning. No, I'm going to say it again. You can't lose for winning. When you realize all that Jesus has done for you and that he's praying for you and you're praying for you, you can't lose for winning. God is on your side. Oh, you got to shake it off. You got to shake off that attitude of defeat that the world has got me that I'm just, no, you're not in trouble. You're in transition. You may be promoted. Sometimes you go through a test, but that test is about because you're usually to go to the next level. (laughs) How many of you remember that in school? You took those tests at the end of the year, like some of our students are coming in to and but it's because God is about to promote you but that you should keep them from the evil one verse 16 they are not of the world just as I am not of the world 17 sanctify them by your truth your word is truth and the essence of what he is saying I want you to consecrate them I want you to make them you know all that you want to be through your word help them to get your word in you verse 18 as you sent me into the world I have also sent them into the world. So you are in this world on assignment by God. And part of the way you overcome is stop rebelling against your assignment and say, I'm here for God. I'm not going to complain about the world. I'm in here to make a difference. You can make a difference by being kind to people that are unkind. You can make a difference by giving a smile to people who have a frown. By helping somebody who's down, there are thousands of ways you can make a difference. You can make a difference by helping people who have no hope to find hope in Jesus. People who don't know love 
to come to know the love of God. There are so many ways that we're here to make a difference, but we need to receive our assignment. In Jesus' name, live it out to the full. Last place I want to go is Psalm 37. I want you to join me in Psalm 37 in your Bible, or either you can follow it along on the screen. It's not printed on the page because I didn't want to print it on the page for you. I wanted you to open your Bible and read it. I wanted you to see this in your Bible if you had your Bible, and you may have to read it later, but I want you to see this. And in Psalm 37, verse 1 says, do not fret because of evildoers. And this is a picture of how the enemy can work and what you can do to overcome the world, okay? Verse 1 says, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. Now, what would it mean to fret? Worry, get all upset, get challenged, get all stirred up. Because of the, or envy the workers of iniquity. I know none of you in here have ever done this. But some Christians sometimes in their walk with the Lord look at people who aren't living for the Lord and think, why am I not out there? Because this over here is a little challenging. And he said, don't fret. And verse 7, he says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Again, you find that word, do not fret. The second sentence, do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Have you ever watched somebody who cares nothing about God and see how prosperous they are? Now, I've had many people, because they were prosperous and living an evil life, try to convince me that it was a stamp of God's goodness upon them. Prosperity can be a stamp of the blessings of God. But if you're living an evil and wicked life and trying to say that's a mark of the blessings of God, you're deceived. And sometimes you can watch the evil people and see them prosperous and say, well, why don't I just become prosperous like them? Don't go there. The next verse, verse 8 says, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. <laughs> Cease from anger, and so this fretting has gone from bad to worse. Now it's to the place where it's created anger and hot-tempered rage of wrath. And look how he ends it. He says, it only causes harm. It only causes harm. So the word of the Lord is, do not fret because of this world. Do not get all upset about it. Don't let it control your thoughts. But then what do I do? And I want to go back to verse 2, and I want you to follow me in this passage of Scripture. And I want to, and, and, and not fretting is the first thing in, this, in, this, in these verses. So the number one thing is do not fret. Somebody say that with me. Do not fret. All right, next thing. Uh, but the, n- verse 2 isn't one of those things, but it is a good reminder. Verse 2 says, for they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. What you need to remember is that every knee will bow one day and every tongue will confess. There is a day of judgment. There is an eternity to come. And somebody would say, well, pastor, I just want to enjoy life while I'm here. Let me tell you something. Your life here is like one drop. If you're st- How many of you have ever stood before the ocean and just contemplated the vastness of that ocean? Have you ever had just a drop of that salty water of the ocean just get on your tongue? Your life here is like one drop of water and the rest of the ocean like eternity. You're a drop that's here for a moment and then it's gone. And so we need to remember that. And there's a day coming. And and, and then, but here's what I want you to see. Verse 3 says, and I'm going to give you... One thing is do not fret. The next thing I want to give you, the second thing is trust in the Lord. Verse 3 says, trust in the Lord. Do not fret, number one. Number two, trust in the Lord. You have to keep your trust in Jesus. Number two, it says, and do good. Not only do I trust in the Lord, but I do good. The devil tries to stop you to get you to stop trusting the Lord. The devil and the world will try to get you to stop doing good. You keep doing good. You keep doing good. Number three, he says, dwell in the land. Number three, dwell in the land. 
What does that mean? Stop trying to put it in B for boogie and get out of here. Just be where you are and be the best where you are. Jeremiah 29, 11 talks about, I know the plans I have for you to give you a hope and a future or an expected end, as some versions say. And a lot of people quote that verse, but they don't read the verses preceding that where they're in a captivity in a foreign land. They want to go home, but God says, build houses and increase there and don't be diminished. God says, dwell where you are and make the best of it. Come on now. Go ahead. You can give the Lord a praise offering on that one. That's good. Dwell in the land. Number one, don't fret. Two, trust the Lord. Three, do good. Four, dwell in the land. Number five, feed on his faithfulness. Come on, come on. Feed on his faithfulness. Remember the goodness of God. Can anybody remember where you were when Jesus saved you? I'm not talking about the location, but do you remember where you were? I mean, do you remember what you were in? Do you know how faithful he was? Come on now. Do you know how strong he was? How many of you have stumbled since then? And you thought, I didn't deserve for him to pick me up, but you found him faithful. You found when I wasn't faithful, but he was faithful. How many of you ever needed a breakthrough or a provision and you didn't deserve it? And you thought, oh my, I don't deserve it. But he, <laughs> he was faithful. Oh, you got to remember the faithfulness of God. Hallelujah. You got to remember the faithfulness of God and recall it to your teaching. Number six, in verse four, he says, delight yourself also in the Lord. And you know, <laughs> man, I could have fun with that one, but we're not going to do that today. Okay. But delight yourself. I mean, that's being happy. That's getting excited. Delight yourself in the Lord. That isn't just kind of squeak by or suffer through. That's let's enjoy this walk with Jesus. Amen. All right, number seven, verse five says, commit your way to the Lord. And it goes on and says, trust also in him and he will bring it to pass. And I want you to see that it says, commit your way to the Lord. There comes a time in this life where the world is around you and you just have to say, Father, sometimes this world has shaken me, it has challenged me, but I'm here to walk in your way. And whatever you've given me to do, it's your way. And I commit it to you, Lord. And Father, if you choose to redirect my way, I'm going to walk in the way that you gave me. Because you are the one who is in charge of my life. When I laid down my life and said, I said, you are Lord. That included all the bumps in the road. That included all the twists and the changes. But I'm walking with you, God. That is the non-negotiable. My way is to walk with the Lord. I commit my way to the Lord, whatever that is, in Jesus' name.